Members, it is time for questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and we will start with the listed questions. I call Ms. Sinead Bradley. Ms. Bradley. Ms. Bradley is not in the chamber. I call Mr. Cahill Boylan. Question number two, please. My department's waste management strategy sets out a framework of policies and actions that contribute towards dealing with waste as effectively as possible by minimising the amount of waste we produce, for example through the carrier bag levy, increasing the amount of waste we reuse and recycle. And where this is not possible, the strategy um, promotes recovery ahead of managed disposal of waste. As well as substantial increases in recycling that have been achieved, we have reduced the amount of waste going to landfill over the past decade so that it has now fallen to its lowest ever level. Since 2004-05, the proportion of household waste, which is landfilled, has more than halved, down from 81.8% to 39.7% in 2015-16. And the household waste recycling rate has more than quadrupled from 10% in 2002 to 42.2% last year. Key elements of the strategy have already been implemented, including publication of the Waste Prevention Programme in September 2014 and the introduction of the Food Waste Regulations in April 2015. Food waste makes up around a quarter of Council's municipal waste and on average costs every household in Northern Ireland almost £500 per year. The separate collection of food waste has the potential to significantly drive up recycling rates as well as generating greater value from this resource. I'm continuing to support efforts to improve waste management by providing £2.5 million to councils through the Rethink Waste Capital Fund for waste prevention, reuse and recycling projects this year. Five of the proposals received from councils to date uh, relate to food waste recycling projects. Well, Mr. Cathal Boyle for a supplementary. Goramogat, I can call you on today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers. Minister, given that it seems that the, the recycling levels have plateaued, how do you intend to reach the 50% target by 2020? Um, I thank, thank the member for, for his question and obviously um, while we would like to get to a, a zero waste economy, um, zero waste isn't something in which we would, which produces absolutely no waste so we need to look at other ways in which to, um, to get to the stage where we are reducing our, our, recycle, our, our landfill. So waste prevention can obviously be achieved by reducing the quantity of material which is used in certain products and also increasing the efficiency with which these products, once created, are used. Um, waste prevention is something, obviously, that encompasses um, various actions that can be undertaken when a product reaches its end of life. But you will also be aware that we are working very closely with councils um, with regards to um, the food waste regulations in Northern Ireland um, 2015. And what we, what we plan to do with them is, obviously, um, to reduce our household waste quite, quite considerably in the amount of foodstuffs which are, which are wasted every year. Um, councils are obligated and will be obligated to improve the provision of food wastes collection schemes to comply with these new regulations by April um, 2017. And that will significantly decrease the amount of waste which goes to, to landfill and will go towards assisting with reaching our targets. Alongside that, we are working with various companies with regards to circular economy and reusing the waste that they have. So, um, a lot of this will be in partnership uh, and working very closely with those partners in order to achieve our targets. Call Mr. Robbie Butler. Speaker, uh, I would like to uh, uh, welcome uh, a zero waste strategy, and I would like to ask the Minister would it be better to first concentrate on tackling the waste dumped as a result of organised crime? And does the Minister believe the current Environmental Crime Unit is up to the task? Um, I'd like to, to thank the, the member for his question and, and I do believe that they are up to the task and they're working very hard in order to, to, um, to bring those who, um, who have been doing wrong to task. Um, certainly this year they have, there, there's been a busy year of work um, and, and this year so far in 2016 there have been 20 prosecutions brought by, by, the, by the crime unit. Um, obviously 
this is something which I do take seriously and which they take seriously and that we'll be working um, together in order to increase the number of prosecutions that are brought to the courts. Call Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you Mr Speaker. Could I ask the Minister in relation to the Mills report and the, the, the identification um, of illegal waste dumping across Northern Ireland, what progress has been made in uh, uh, achieving prosecutions, particularly in relation to the dump at Moboy? Um, I thank the member for his question. And as I've said, there has been. Um, I obviously can't comment in relation to the case that's ongoing in Lowboy, but certainly um, the recommendations from the Mills report um, are being worked through by my department. Um, and certainly, um, you'll re um, recall from the previous um, question that there have been 20 prosecutions this year to date, and obviously something that we are very focused on and want to want to ensure um, doesn't recur. Um, and so, I'm, I'm very positive about the work that's being done. Mr. Connor Murphy is not in his place. I call Ms. Pam Cameron. Question number four, please. Uh, thank the member for asking this question and for raising the profile of this important issue. Uh, the Partnership for Action Against Wildlife Crime in Northern Ireland, Paul NI, is a multi agency body uh, comprising representatives of the organisations involved in wildlife law enforcement. Paul NI partners include key government departments, including four DARA divisions, PSNI, NDPBs, NGOs, gamekeeping groups, and land owning interests. It affords opportunities for statutory and non government organisations to work together to combat wildlife crime. Paul NI was established in, Mar in April 20, um, 2007. I welcome the publication of the Paul NI Raptor report as it clearly highlights a number of problem areas within Northern Ireland. Of course, the report only accounts um, the known cases where the birds were found and tested. The report is a beneficial tool, aiding future enforcement and detection action. Rather worryingly, it indicates an ongoing disregard for public safety by a small number of people within our community who are placing highly toxic poisons where wildlife, livestock, pets and people could come into contact with them. And also there are people misusing presumably legally owned firearms, um, either intentionally or recklessly with a similar disregard for safety. Enhancing biodiversity is a central objective of my department. The loss of our top predators from our ecosystems by acts of persecution is extremely disturbing. These are key uh, keystone species and their loss has a detrimental impact right the way down the food chain. I would call on those responsible for these reckless acts to cease doing so, and I urge anyone who may have information about these crimes to contact the PSNI or indeed Crime Stoppers. Call Ms Cameron for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her very comprehensive answer. It is quite disturbing um, to hear the detail of that. But uh, could I ask the Minister um, what her department is doing to reduce wildlife crime throughout Northern Ireland? Uh, again, I thank the member for her question. And, and while I, I do welcome the report, it does trouble me somewhat in that it is caveated by saying that it's likely that the figures presented here represent only a fraction of the number of incidents. Um, many do remain undetected and unreported because these crimes are primarily taking place in very remote areas. Um, as the member will be aware, the enforcement of what the wildlife order is generally carried out by the PSNI. My officials from NIEA assist the PSNI um, by provision of technical support and also advice. Um, and we work um, alongside others in, in trying to um, stop this. Um, my officials um, from several remits across the department also sit on Paul NI group. And this group works with a range of partners in order to reduce wildlife crime. Um, the department is obviously keen to further develop its relationship with Paul and I partners, and additionally, we would be open to providing high-level support to Paul and I group should it be requested. I call Mr. Justin McNulty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the minister for her answers thus far? Can I ask the minister what consideration she has made of the benefit of, the, of a public information program? I mean, helping to reduce the number of attacks on birds of prey and their nests. 
Th I thank the, the member for his question and indeed um, any uh, public information that can go out in order to um, desist from this is obviously welcome. Um, the member may be aware that in earlier this year Operation Raptor um, was announced and again this is a public awareness um, uh, programme in order to, to focus on this. But I think that there's a there's an onus on all of us, even as elected representatives, become involved in this and to highlight within our local press um, and to get involved with local groups as well. Call Mr. Oliver McMullen. And can I thank the minister for her answer so far? And I, and I will agree with you on on the protection of the birds. You did mention there Operation Raptor. Could you perhaps give us a, an update on where we are with that? Um, organisation or that report? Um, thank, thank the member for, for his question and as he's aware um, it was launched in, in March this year. Um, it runs indefinitely and it, I would guess that we're probably not going to really understand the benefits of that until the next report is, is published um, but I would um, again um, reiterate what I said to the previous member that I would encourage um, elected representatives become very much involved in this campaign and to raise awareness and, and while this is a, a poster campaign is, is associated with um, Operation Raptor, particularly those who, who represent rural areas um, may want to look at um, acquiring those, those um, pieces of information and, and posters for their offices. Call Mr Harold McKay. Uh, Minister, this has been a particular problem, problem in the morns with the red kites being targeted. Can the Minister provide an update on how many birds have been killed over recent years? Um, thank thank the, the member for his question. And while I don't have a total number, what I am aware is from that, the most recent report that four red kites and four buzzard, two peregrine, um, one sparrowhawk and a raven um, were highlighted within that, this particular report. Um, and it is an issue that isn't just um, focusing on, on the South Down area, but in other areas as, as well. Um, but I'm quite happy to, to get the, the full range of um, final figures for to the member. Call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Question five, Mr. Speaker. The interim figures for NIEA's performance in 2016-17 shows that 91% statutory responses have been issued to councils within agreed time frames. NIEA remains on track to meet its business, key business target of 90% this year and has an ongoing programme of initiatives which aim to continually improve its performance. Currently up to this point in the reporting year, NIEA has received 2,055 consultations of which 1,865 were responded to within the 21-day target or an agreed time frame. The average time for response to a consultation is 12 days from NIEA. It's important that appropriate information is provided by applicants to enable the planning authority to make timely and positive decisions. The department aims to contribute to this process by providing clear guidance and standing advice to help applicants and planning officials understand what information is required to facilitate timely planning. Mr Dunn for a supplementary. Thank you Mr Speaker and I thank the Minister for her answers. Does the Minister agree that an efficient and effective NAEA is important for an effective planning process and can the Minister give us some more information on the performance of NAEA so far this year for the different council areas? Um, I, um, I thank the, the member for his question and, and indeed um, NIEA do have an important role to play in all this but he'll also be mindful of the fact that the ultimate decisions with regards to planning applications lie with the local councils. Um, so, but the, obviously the, the, the number of consultations which um, NIEA and will look at varies considerably across the council areas and where NIEA's response performance for a particular council is above average, this obviously could reflect a large number of straightforward applications, for example for single dwellings or different type development types where NIEA has issued standing advice. Lower than average performance in response times 
may be due to a higher proportion of major or perhaps complex applications which have been received which require the provision and assessment of large amounts of environmental information. Um, what I can provide the member um, is sort of a general overview of, of, of some of the councils and he, he will be pleased to know that um, in, in, in our council area, in Ards and North Down um, Borough Council where 242 um, applications were received, the responses um, within 22, 21 days and agreed extensions was 97 per cent. So only 10 um, of the, it was actually 10, there were 10 days were taken to um, respond was the average for that area. Um, the area probably where it has the lowest return would be in Fermanagh and Oma District Council um, where the average is around 17 days. Call Mr Danny Kennedy. Speaker, grateful to the Minister for her answers uh, thus far. Is the Minister aware of the discrepancies in the length of time it's taking some local councils to progress agricultural planning applications for instance in Antrim and uh, Newton Abbey? Uh, agricultural related applications last year took an average of 18 weeks compared to over a year in Newry, Morn and Down. Will the Minister investigate that? Uh, is there any issues for NIEA and with ministerial colleagues? Thank the, thank the member for his question, and indeed, I will I'll refer that to um, colleagues in NIEA. But as I will reiterate, there is a, that planning does not lie within my department, um, and it's something perhaps that needs to be looked up with, taken up with the local councils directly. Thank you. Call Ms. Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, does the minister agree that an independent, well-funded agency would be able to respond in a more timely manner to such consultations? Um, I thank the, the member for, his que for her question and, and I thought that I probably had outlined quite well actually that um, NIEA do respond in a timely manner um, but I, I've answered this question several times before in relation to an independent environment agency and that's something which I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not actually in the mind to, to look at. Call Mr Christopher Stalford. Six, Mr Speaker. I welcome the latest report on air quality in Northern Ireland, published by my department on the 22nd of November. The report clearly shows that air quality in Northern Ireland is continuing to improve, although we continue to have problems with emissions from road traffic at certain locations. The report notes that long-term roadside levels of pollutants in Belfast are mostly decreasing, albeit at a slower rate than I would like. In addressing air quality in Belfast and across Northern Ireland, my department has commenced a review of air quality policy and legislation with the intention of developing a dedicated Northern Ireland air quality strategy and revised local air quality management policy guidance. This review will consider new thinking on air quality policy across the UK and internationally aimed at reducing emissions from all sources to protect public health assist with climate change targets and improve congestion. And these policies will be consulted on in due course. In addition to this review, my department currently provides funding support to councils, including Belfast City Council, to carry out their statutory local air quality management and action plan duties and has worked closely with Belfast City Council and with the Department for Infrastructure to draw up an air quality action plan for the Greater Belfast area. The air quality issues here are predominantly due to road traffic emissions. Therefore, the plan focuses on introducing measures relating to sustainable transport, such as the forthcoming Belfast Rapid Transit Scheme, the development of the Belfast Transport Hub, park and ride, as well as strategies that promote public transport, walking and cycling. Mr Stalford for a supplementary. I'm grateful to the Minister for that very full answer. Does the Minister agree with me in terms of tackling congestion? Any air quality strategy must have significant investment in infrastructure, including the York Street interchange. I, I totally agree with the, with the member and as the former Minister for Regional Development, I was very much involved in some of those projects and in particular um, the, the York Street interchange. Um, 
as a former member of Belfast City Council, the member will also know that um, the council has declared the West Link Corridor as an air quality management area from York Street to the city boundary. This is an area which carries approximately 100,000 vehicles per day. The development of the York Street Interchange project is one of the principal measures in reducing transport emissions along the West Link Corridor and is one of the, a range of measures that DFI has agreed with the Council to include in their Air Quality Action Plan. It is therefore vitally important that this project goes ahead. But this isn't the only project, obviously, where um, there, are, there are issues around air quality, and, and certainly the Dungiven Bypass is another one in Northern Ireland, um, and is, is and certainly a project which I, I would like to see um, moving forward very quickly. Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Minister. Um, Given that um, the, the, there's an increase in population in the carried off Saintfield Road area, um, will the Minister agree with me that um, the introduction of a greenway from carried off down the city centre would be a very good proposal to include in your action plan? Thank the member for her question. And, and again, as I, I'll say as the former minister, I was very much um, keen in, produce, in forwarding um, in seeing um, projects such as that move forward um, as, a, as someone who has a greenway in the constituency. I, and as a user of that green, greenway, I see the benefits of it. Um, I see the benefits of, of cycling. But also, um, given the, the increase in population in that area, I'd also be advising that, mem that members of the public do use the park and ride um, and take advantage of the, the um, public transport system that is in place in that area. Call Ms. Claire Bailey. Um, would the Minister um, acknowledge that four major cities have already committed to banning diesel cars by 2025 due to air pollution levels um, and let the House know if she has any intentions of doing the same? Um, thank the member for her question and I suppose I'd have to declare an interest as a driver of a diesel car. Um, but, at, but at this stage, um, no, I don't have any intention to do so. Well, Ms. Kiva Archibald. Margaret Concordia, um, thank the Minister for her responses so far. And she may be aware that it was reported last week that one of the air quality monitors in Dungiven wasn't working and hasn't been for some time. And I understand it's Council's responsibility to replace that. But I wonder, did, was the Department aware that it wasn't working? And whose responsibility is it to act in a request for a replacement? Thank the member for her question. And yes, I am aware of that, and as I was aware of the issue on the Ormond Road as well. It's my understanding that that has actually been out of use since March this year, um, and the, the reason why it hasn't been replaced is due to an issue around replacement parts. Um, the Causeway Coast and Glen are in the process of procuring uh, a, a new monitor, and um, I understand that they are still continuing to be able to monitor pollution, but they're using a, a different method in order to do so. Before I call Ms Mallon, can I remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, then they should stand continually in their place. Ms Mallon. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, can I thank the Minister for her answers to date and also her commitment to uh, tackling air pollution, but could I seek assurances um, from the Minister um, that we will maintain the current levels of environmental protection for air quality in the event of any Brexit? Um, I thank the member for her question, uh, and obviously um, Brexit won't have anything, won't have an impact in relation to this. The, um, the executive are give, have given a commitment to this, and certainly you will understand that from the, um, our programme for government that we're recognising the importance of air quality and have a target against the air quality indicators to reduce the levels of nitrogen dioxide recorded across all the monitoring stations in Northern Ireland. Um, we have a draft, the draft delivery plan. Um, there's an indicator which is currently out for consultation that contains the various measures which we're looking at. Um, but as a department generally, we're looking right across the piece with regards to how, um, how air pollution can be um, uh, tackled. And that's across not only the issues around transport, but also within the agriculture sector as well. I call Lord Morrow. Apologies. With your um, 
In responding to a parliamentary question last week about fishing rights in Loch Foyle and Carlingford Lock after the UK leaves the EU, the Secretary of State restated the UK's position that the whole of Loch Foyle is within the United Kingdom. The ownership issue of both locks is not a matter within the competence of this Assembly. However, I know that the Irish Government, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and Crown Estate have been talking about this issue for quite some time. I understand that the next meeting between the two governments is scheduled for later this month in Dublin. My immediate concern is that the ongoing dispute is impacting on the ability of the LOCKS agency to effectively manage aquaculture activities, particularly licensing in Loch Foyle. I am therefore anxious that it is resolved. For this reason, it was discussed during my first North-South Ministerial Council meeting in September in relation to how the ongoing dispute is adversely affecting the operational activities of the LOCKS agency. The pressing priority for all those involved in these discussions should be to come to an arrangement which will allow the LOCKS agency to properly fulfil its role. Call Lord Morrow for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Having listened to what she has said, and she has related that this is causing difficulties with the issue of agriculture uh, licensing, to what extent is she being kept abreast of what is happening here or her department? And surely this whole hiatus is causing uh, problems around the sensible running of her department in relation to what we're speaking about here today. Thank the, the member for his question. Um, as, the, as the member has highlighted, this is something which has been going on for quite some time. In fact, it dates back to 1662 and the Charter of Charles II, where he granted the waters in the bed as well as the fisheries of Loch Foyle to the Irish Society and included them as part of County Londonderry. Um, um, but as, he, as you're aware, that the lock is now the responsibility of the locks agency, and, and certainly the fact that there is, there is obviously a claim now, there is a claim by the Irish government in relation to the fact that they haven't accepted um, the position of the United Kingdom. This is, this is obviously causing ongoing um, problems, particularly with regards to the aquaculture licensing um, around the lock foil, but also for any sort of future management that we'd like to put in place, particularly for lock foil and Carlingford locks. This is something which is ongoing and we would like to, to see resolved as soon as possible. Call Mr Robin Swan. Uh, Minister, just for clarity, could you actually inform the House how many licences have been issued for agriculture by the locks agency for lock foil and also what work has been undertaken to ensure there's no illegal beds been set down instead? Or would she consider that an ecumenical matter? Thank, thank the member for his question. And there is an issue in relation to um, illegal fishery, fisheries in, in the foil. Um, there's been a substantial increase in, them, in the number of, on, of unregulated oyster trestles, um, in excess of 400% um, on the Donegal side of Loch Foyle in recent times. Um, and this in itself is causing a particular issue, particularly hazard and risk um, for navigational and also health and safety hazard in the lock. Um, at this stage, it's, it's, it's not possible to issue, issue licenses um, because of what's ha currently happening. Call Mr. Chris Little. Question number eight, Mr. Speaker. Legislation to address climate change is already in place in the form of the UK-wide Climate Change Act. The Act establishes a long-term target of an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 against a 1990 baseline. Interim targets are in effect set by five-year carbon budgets, which are legislated in advance by statutory instrument laid in Westminster as a requirement of the Act. The current carbon budget for the whole of the UK targets a 34% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2020. I wrote recently to the Secretary of State supporting a new, legis new legislation at Westminster for a UK carbon budget of a 57% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. The latest greenhouse gas inventory published in June 2016 shows a reduction of 17.4% from 1990 levels whilst the most recent projections indicate that we are on target to achieve a 34.1% reduction 
by 2025. The need to take action on climate change and its importance to the executive is demonstrated through measures included in the draft delivery plan for indicator 29 of the draft program for government. An annual progress report is submitted by the cross-departmental working group on climate change on the executive summarising progress um, made towards the uh, reduction of greenhouse gas. I'm satisfied that progress has been made in reducing greenhouse gas emissions in Northern Ireland. I'm content with the plans currently in place or being developed that will reduce our emissions further. And in these circumstances, I currently see no need to introduce a Northern Ireland climate change bill. I'm sorry, Mr. Little, we don't have time for a supplementary. Questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Steve Aiken. Uh, could I ask the Minister what discussions she's had with ARC 21 in relation to residual waste treatment? Um, I thank the, the member for his question, but since coming into office as, and as Minister, I haven't had any discussions. Mr. Aiken, for a supplementary. Um, I'm quite surprised by that. Um, in the Minister, in view of the commitment she has made to the Chair of ARC 21 in her letter dated the 25th of July, in which she stated she would recommend to the Northern Ireland Executive that she would consider the provision of financial support to ARC 21, could she then, in view of the cost of the $1.8 billion Renewable Heat Initiative scandal, state what discussions she's had with the Finance Minister? in how this open-ended commitment to ARC 21 Mr. can be met, a what advice she received, and in the spirit of openness and transparency, can she tell us how much it's likely to cost? Thank the, the member for his question, and as he'll be aware that the ARC 21 scheme is currently with the PAC. Um, the report will then go to DFI for the minister to consider. Um, in the event, of the project actually getting a green light, it will require a viable business case. My department at that stage will then consider making a case um, to the executive for financial support in order to ensure that ratepayers do not incur an unfair financial burden as a result of meeting a Northern Ireland wide obligation. This is a position which is no different to that taken by the UK government or um, the rest of those in the UK or indeed by the previous um, Department for the Environment. Um, as yet, I have not had a conversation with the Finance Minister in relation to this. Um, as I've said, there's still a business case needs to be drawn up, but we're still some way off before a decision has been made on this. Well, Mr. Roy Beggs. Earlier, the, min the Minister mentioned the issue of greenhouse gas emission. Can the Minister advise what assessment has been made by the Department and the Northern Ireland Environment Agency of the adverse environmental impact of wasteful burning of the Renewable Energy Initiative. Um, thank the, the member for his question. And at this stage, I haven't received a, a, a report in relation to that. Call Mr. Robbie Butler. Sorry, Mr. Beggs for a supplement. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the Minister accept that it is damaging to our environment, increase, increasing unnecessary CO2 emissions, and the worst of all for is the public are paying for all this to happen, costing us in our pockets, and yet we're damaging the environment? Why is public money being used to damage the, the environment? Um, I, I thank the member for his question, but that's outside my remit in relation to this. Call Mr. Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister to provide an update on the rural mobile health check clinics? Um, yeah, I, th I thank the, the member for his question, and then he'll be aware that this is a scheme which has been ongoing for quite some time, and that I had the privilege, actually, of um, welcoming the 12,000th um, uh, recipient of the health checks to Field Mart just the week before last. Mr. Butler, for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, I'm not sure what happened in the Sainfield as an overall update, but 
Uh, that aside, these checks have been an invaluable service in rural areas. Will the Minister commit to reviewing these clinics and work alongside the Public Health Agency to ensure that they are also adequately identifying and signposting poor mental health issues? I thank the member for his question and I absolutely agree with everything that he has said and having met a number of people who have actually benefited from them um, and speaking to the staff and I would recommend actually if the, if the member does get the chance actually to, to meet up with the staff who, who, who man um, uh, uh, and do that um, out of, in very unsociable hours as well I have to say um, but they, people have found them beneficial and particularly where you have farmers who are perhaps living on their own and are um, isolated and don't always look after their own health and aren't very mindful of their own health. They're very much mindful of the welfare of their animals, but forget us often about themselves. And these, this has been a, a fantastic service um, and the, people have found the benefit of it. Call Mrs. Sander over. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we all know that the First Minister is in China this week, and I, I believe that the Chinese veterinary officials were in Northern Ireland here in late October. Can the Minister, um, that was in connection with uh, exporting uh, pork products. Can the Minister tell us uh, where in Northern Ireland did those uh, officials visit, and uh, was there any progress made during that visit or since? Okay, um, I thank the, the, the member for a question. Obviously, the, the, they're visiting the, the pork plants in Northern Ireland. Um, the, I, I, as I was in China myself just a few weeks ago, um, I had the opportunity to, to speak to a number of officials. Um, I also met with, with Andrea Ledsom last week, who has, has since been in China. Um, and we're all getting very positive information back with regards to um, the export of our, our pork products to China. Um, so we're expecting hopefully good news in the not so distant future. As obviously this is, this is um, something which is um, very lucrative for our, our plants and there's an, es uh, an estimate that it could be worth somewhere in the region of 10 million pounds to Northern Ireland economy. Well, Mrs. Overham for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that information. But I am concerned because I believe they didn't make it to my constituency. Uh, of Mid Ulster the, and specifically the Carrow Food Group in, in Cookstown, but instead prioritised uh, a, a visit from, from Dungannon to the Giants Causeway, which actually goes through Cookstown. Uh, and so uh, I may need to uh, register an interest in this particular question because my husband supplies pigs into Carrow, but I, I really would like to hear an explanation from the Minister in that regard. Thank the member for a question, and I, I will I certainly come back to the member with regards to the details in relation to that. I wasn't aware of that. Call Mrs. Rosemary Bard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the minister think taxpayers' money has been wisely spent after her department paid 600,000 for half an acre of land in relation to their new, her new headquarters in Ballykelly? Um, I thank the, 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 the member for her question um, and the member will be aware that this was something which was um, done before my time in office um, so um, it, was, it was before I was, I, was put it, I was in my position but what you may want to take into consideration the fact that this is a, this is a, a development which will allow for 600 jobs in the northwest there are economic benefits to that. Um, my understanding is that um, this was seen as value for money at the time in order to ensure that this um, project went ahead. Well, Mrs Barton for her supplementary. Thank you. Uh, Minister, given this project never had a full business case, given that OFMDFM had to issue two ministerial directions in respect of it, and given other vacant buildings, such as in Coleraine, have been deliberately overlooked, does the minister accept this project is increasingly becoming a drain on public resources? I um, thank, thank the, the, the member for her question, but I will go back to the original question in so much that this was a decision which was taken um, in the last mandate. Um, it was given executive approval at that particular time. Construction has now commenced and the building um, is scheduled to be complete and open by January 2018 where it will, it will then start the business in which it's designed to do, which is to accommodate um, employees in the northwest of Northern Ireland. Well, Ms. Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I, I want to come back to the issue of air pollution because I'm really quite alarmed um, that given 
that there are approximately 500 deaths per year in Northern Ireland directly due to air pollution qualities um, and that the Minister has just stated that she is content with um, Northern Ireland being the lowest region in the UK in meeting um, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. Can the Minister let us know what are her plans to raise awareness with the public on this very serious and immediate danger to life? Um, I thank the, the member for her question and I, I know that she may be alarmed by all of this but I, I have to say that um, there is work which is ongoing um, with, right across my department and she'll be aware that obviously the, the executive are taking this very seriously um, and our consultation is out with regards to the key indicator for number um, 29 with regards to um, uh, air pollution. Um, there are a number of things which are being done right across um, all of our departments which are working in, um, in collaboration with, with departments for a mitigation action plan. Um, there are good achievements to date with regards to energy. We have 25% of our total electricity consumption um, is now generated for local renewables resources. We have the ongoing expansion of the natural gas network. We are working with, a lot with colleagues in um, transport for a new cycling infrastructure. Um, there are additional electric vehicle charging infrastructure and also around agriculture, which is obviously one which is probably one of the trickiest to look at. Um, we have the Efficient Farming Cuts Greenhouse Gases Phase 1 initiative. Um, I've also received very recently the independent report which, is com which was commissioned on a sustainable agricultural land management strategy. So my department is taking this really very seriously um, and um, I do believe that the work that's going forward um, will assist in reducing our targets. And as I've said, I've written, written very recently to the Secretary of State um, to work alongside her in order to reduce the overall um, tar or the to increase, I suppose, the target to 57% by 2025. Well, Ms Bailey for her supplementary. Thank you, and um, thank the Minister for that. That all sounds like good work being done, but I'm still not sure as to how this raises awareness with the public themselves as to, to this. Um, could the Minister maybe perhaps commit to not driving a diesel car throughout that as well and encourage others to do the same? <laughs> I'm not sure that I can commit to that because I do very much like my car. Um, uh, but what, what, I what, what I will be doing is working alongside um, colleagues in other departments to ensure that, that they do raise awareness in relation to this because we are all, all in this together um, and there is a job of work for us in order to, re to, to, to reach our targets. Stop taking trips to China and America. Call Mr Gordon Dunn. Thank you Mr Speaker and thank the Minister for answers to date. Can the Minister give us some information in relation to the basic payment scheme, better known as the single farm payment scheme? I understand that a lot of people have been caught up in the appeal process within your department. Can you give us an assessment of the overall progress of the appeal pr process, please? Um, thank the member for his question. Obviously, the introduction of cap reform area-based schemes has led to an unprecedented increase in the number of review decision applications received by my department. Review of decisions is an important part of the decision-making process that provides farmers and farm businesses with the opportunity to seek a reconsideration where they believe that the department did not reach the correct decision in respect of an area-based payment. Whilst the current process has been meeting objectives, I am nevertheless concerned at the time taken to issue final decisions, and I have therefore asked my officials to review our current provision and put in place a process which better meets the needs of farmers for the 2017 scheme year going forward. This work will be taken forward in consultation with our stakeholders over the coming months. However, my immediate priority is to address the timelines of final decisions for those already waiting reviews arising from the introduction of CAP reform area-based schemes. Therefore, my officials will shortly engage with stakeholders to determine a means by which review decisions can be streamlined and made more efficient. Well, Mr. Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer. Can the Minister advise how many of the delays are in the process, or sorry, how many of the applications are delayed within the, the actual process, and that the necessary resources will be made available to try and resolve the issues? I thank the, the member for his question, and, and I can't give him an exact figure at the moment, but I'm happy to give that to him. Call Mr. Paul Frey. 
you, Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister to give the House uh, an update on her department in progressing uh, the issue of cap payments? I thank the, the member for his question and obviously um, the decision in relation to um, to cut payments and what it will look like um, post Brexit will be something which we will be looking at um, in due course. Um, I'm, I'm not actually quite sure um, what else he's asked, but I, I didn't pick up on that, but I'll pick it up in supplementary. Mr. Frew, for a supplementary. Sorry. Uh, uh thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. No, I, I asked the Minister, I'm sorry she didn't hear me. Uh, for the progress on issuing of the cap payments, but she, uh, she maybe could answer also what percentage of payments were cleared by the 1st of December, uh, which was the first possible date to issue uh, the full payments. Um, apologies, I, 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 you must have spoken into my deaf ear. Um, um, as, the, as the member will be aware, 90, over 90 per cent of eligible farmers received an advance payment, um, and that was from October, which equated to 158 million pounds. Um, December the 1st was the very first day that full payments could then be made, and we have issued um, from that day it was 21,372 payments were issued, and that's 91 per cent of eligible farmers, and that's on day one. That's 3,540 more payments than, than day one last year. Um, the target is set for 95 per cent of eligible applicants by the end of um, December, and I'm confident that we will meet that target. Members, time is up.